Hello, everyone. Welcome to Cloud Wars Live, where generally we discuss the digital revolution that's sweeping the world, but we've now begun over the last several weeks to also talk about that other revolution that's hit our world pretty hard. Uh, the whole impact of COVID-19, the work from home revolution, some of the things that are happening. And our guest today to help us look a little bit about what's going on now, how to prepare for the future, how to get into that, be ready when the next wave of change hits us is Charles Araujo. And uh, Charles is an industry analyst. He's an author, a public speaker. He's got some great things going on today at Your Digital Future. Charlie, welcome to Cloud Wars Live. We're glad to have you back for your second show. Excited to be back. It's uh, always good to talk with you. Thanks. So now, Charlie, tell us a little bit about, you know, what you talk to clients, you do your own thinking. What is going on here on, you know, around on around April 20th? What's the top of mind thing that you hear from people or their, their level of concerns? I think everyone is, uh, is probably concerned about a lot of the same things in, in that what we're all dealing with is the uncertainty factor here of just how, I mean, leaving the politics of this aside of whether or not we should have seen this coming in terms of a big pandemic, there's no question. I mean, I've, I've been watching this fairly closely. And yet, you know, at the beginning of March, I was in California for my father's 70th birthday, and we were talking about it. But I certainly didn't foresee the enormity and the suddenness of this that just it just came down like a cinder block, just boom, and like overnight. And so that creates a lot of anxiety. I, you know, I, we're, I, for my standpoint, I'm still unsure of exactly how this is going to play out, how much of this is just driven by that abruptness. And so therefore, people are just sort of really locking down and, and taking a wait and see, and how much of this is truly long lasting, at least from an economic standpoint. So I think that uncertainty uh, is certainly the, the big elephant in the room. And, and it's a really debilitating factor. I mean, it's something that we certainly have talked about from an organizational change perspective, when, when we are uncertain as humans, we start locking down. And I think we're all collectively living that right now. And uh, Charlie, no, it, it's funny. I, uh, whether I'm naive or not, you know, who knows, but I, I am an optimist. I think that there's going to be some hard times ahead to be sure catching up, getting things going. 22 million Americans out of work is it's about unfathomable. But I think when things get going again, one of the things we'll find it, you know, before March, whatever date you want to pick, 1st, 5th, 10th, whenever things really, really changed, there was significant evidence pointing to the fact, and that this ties to your point about uncertainty, there was significant evidence around the fact that companies were going to start to be able to tie together some notion of their demand chain and their supply chain. And I don't mean that we'll ever have perfect information or something like that, but it was getting to be pretty good where we were able to wring a little bit more uncertainty out of things. And now, as you say, bam, you get the two by four across the face. And um, so how do you advise people to try to reconcile or deal with this, this, you know, big uh, boogeyman of uncertainty here? Well, I think, you know, it's interesting. So I wrote an article recently that it sort of came roaring back in relevance. Um, so about four years ago or so, I ended up putting together something called the Digital Enterprise Readiness Framework. And it was, it was, it was predicated on this idea that there was all this talk about digital transformation. It was still a pretty, pretty new topic. And as I say in my article, I was already sick of it. And I was sick of it because people were talking about it like it's this one dimensional project, like it was just another checklist item. And my whole point was that it, this was the new way that we were all gonna be functioning because it was gonna be this, this degree of uncertainty that, that we were gonna be in this constant state of adapting and, and being, having to pivot our ideas at this, the, the way that things worked out the industrial age where it was, hey, this is how things worked and you knew exactly, you could predict it. We, we knew it was gonna basically happen. Yeah. It, was, it was the outliers that were the changes. And so the whole idea behind digital readiness was this idea that you had an uncertain future. You didn't know what was going to happen. So therefore, you had to build a set of fundamentals, a fundamental capabilities that gave you resiliency, that gave you the ability to pivot and adapt. And honestly, I had done that work and the Institute uh, has, has you know, brought that up in terms of some products and what have you, but I've been focused on other things. And then as all this was coming and I was kind of observing how some organizations were really sort of rising to this challenge and some were totally struggling, it just sort of kind of connected the dots for me again. It's like, 
yeah, those organizations that have this sort of cultural readiness are going to be much more resilient in the face of uncertainty, whether it's pandemic induced or whatever else. And so I think that's what we're going to see really come to the, to the front of the line here. Um, I was laughing when, uh, you know, you mentioned that thing about being sort of sick of uh, some of the terminology around transformation and so on like that. And I, I think um, one of the times about a year or so ago, but somebody said digital transformation, is that like when I can deposit a check uh, using my phone? And I said, oh, sure. <laughs> but uh, try, there's, there's so much to be done there. And so let me ask you to dig into that a little bit. You just described some companies are going to be able to get it and not the cultural readiness. So yeah. what's in that cultural readiness uh, factor that allows some companies to succeed and others uh, are just going to have a terrible time of it? So when, when I talk about readiness, the first thing is, is it's not, you know, try to the distinction is that digital transformation is something you do as an example on top of the state of readiness. Likewise, uh, one of the things else I wrote in this article was the fact that as I've talked to companies um, recently, they've all been talking about executing their business continuity plans. And like, it, first of all, yay, I remember fighting those battles, the fact that they had a plan and it was actually executable, awesome, right? But yeah. that too, your ability to execute a BCP is going to be largely contingent on the state of cultural readiness. And so, and the reason is, is the way I, um, the, 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 the correlation I draw is if you think about a sports team or an elite military unit or the best business leadership teams is that what you find is that it's not that they had a specific tactic or strategy that was their, you know, secret sauce. That in fact, it was their ability to have these sort of fundamental underlying components that gave them the ability to pivot. And, and so those really come down to a couple things. One is, is, practice, right? You talk to these, again, military sports teams are useful analogies because what do they do? They drill, they drill, they drill, they drill. It becomes muscle memory. But implicit in that is also things like communication. They understand how to communicate sometimes even, you know, in, in a very microcosm, right? Wordlessly, right? If you ever, my, my father was, um, we did a lot of work with military units in a business that we had and watching these Navy SEALs, how they interacted, watching them drill, was utterly fascinating because they communicated so much with body language and signals that it wasn't even verbal, right? The same thing from an organizational standpoint of having that degree of, of deeply interwoven communication, having things like, like um, uh, vision clarity, right? Understanding clearly what your vision is, what your strategic objectives are, that everyone is moving and, and they understand their role in it. And, and th this framework is actually very robust. There's all these different components. I won't go through all of them, but it's basically this idea that you have to have this sort of operational foundation that you can execute flawlessly, that you need to have the ability to pivot. You need to know when to pivot and you need to have a culture at the core of it that's willing to challenge the status quo that doesn't get locked into the inertia, right? And so these are all these kind of cultural dynamics that lay the foundation for you then to do whatever else you need to do on top of it. Yeah, um, Charlie, there's a, a guy, uh, you know, he's one of the first, I guess, astronauts, pilot, test pilots, Chuck Yeager. And uh, one of his lines, right, was he said, if you're not looking for trouble, you've got it. And your notion there about this sense of constant preparedness, you hear Jeff Bezos and the every day is day one, you know, always be ready for this, be on the lookout. And I think that's going to be one of the major lessons that emerges from this because you could have a company that was, you know, hammering away, executing nicely, but they get hit by something like this that's way outside of, you know, comfort zone, culture, things like that. And there's going to be people scrambling who resist the notions of all what you're talking about. They say, well, that's not what we do. That's not my job. That's not how we operate. We don't do things that blah, blah, blah you know, all those things like that, they've got them trapped. And meanwhile, the world is going to be moving real fast on past them. And I don't know that some of these companies who are trapped in that uncertainty bubble are ever going to be able to get out of it. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. I, I'm waiting. It's going to take a while, I think, for some of the stories to emerge from within the enterprise. So right now, I'm sort of relying on anecdotal stories from smaller organizations. But I just tweeted out a great story. I don't remember what it was in Wall Street Journal, New York Times, one of those, but it was about this restaurant chain in Chicago. And when I say chain, high-end restaurants, a handful of them, they also um, operate an app for mobile delivery. And I love it because it exhibits all of these things we're talking about, right? I mean, first of all, they did the hard things. They, they had to lay people off and, and what have you. 
but they immediately recognized, right? This is the sensing part. They immediately recognized that this was not business as usual and they couldn't just do what almost every other restaurant in the country has done, which is simply tried to do their existing business, but now just suddenly we're just gonna do it all via delivery. They immediately retooled, they completely rebuilt their menu with a focus on things that they could deliver, that could be delivered, that would, would stay warm or longer, that could be easy, more easily reheated. Um, they immediately changed their business model of how they operated long before any of this was mandated. They, they changed their app that was all about, um, it was sort of about delivery, but now it was, it, they shifted it to do pickups and organizing it so that you didn't get um, slammed because the, 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 the ordering systems out there today just assume that, Restaurants can take all the takeout orders they could handle because that's how it used to be. Well, this one replicated the way that a restaurant kitchen would only have so many people seated at one time. Same idea, only takes so many orders. So what I loved it, it was just this complete re-envisioning of their business model to meet the current needs. And that is that sort of agility at, at all these. So I call it organizational agility, which is the mechanisms to pivot and strategic agility, seeing what's coming and being willing to go through it. And then this idea of the disruptive culture of being willing to sort of throw off, hey, this is how we've all, and this was a fine dining restaurant, like a five-star restaurant, right? right? Throwing away this whole idea that that's how we had to function and being willing to embrace what was new. That is the model for, I think, every organization going forward. And there's just not a lot of examples of organizations so far that are willing to do that. So I think when I talk about readiness, that's what it really means and what it looks like. Well, th there's another thread, Charlie, you know, from the article, which is why readiness is delivering powerful results during this crisis that you had written. I also wanted to ask you about um, your notion in there, you, you cover the idea of creativity, but you said personal expressions of creativity. And how does that play in with organizational agility? So, yeah, I was referencing, I've written quite a bit recently about the expansive, I guess we'll say, personal creativity that we've seen people exhibit right now. And, and it's been fun, right? It's, it's, uh, there's been a lot of things that have been hilarious and it's been the sort of bonding thing as a society. But what's interesting is that I think a lot of organizations have failed to recognize that all that creativity exists. And, and so I, this, the previous article was all about, you need to go and harness that. Well, what is interesting is that, is that that same fundamental creativity and imagination is also what powers this sort of disruptiveness or this willing to be agile and to pivot, right? So at the end of the day, going back to this restaurant example, it is an act of creativity to, to take that step back and say, let's just, let's just forget everything we've done. Let's look at the building blocks, right? What do we have? We, we have a kitchen. We have, we have people that know how to cook. We have people that know how to serve and deliver. We have this app. What do we have? How can we reassemble this in a way that is more appropriate for the circumstances today? That is an act of creativity. And so I think that by, so, you know, one of the other deeper kind of elements here is that organizations have to be embracing this. We too often sort of shun it. We say, you know, being creative is, that's great. Do that on your own time or doing these itty bitty pockets, or we're going to have this one little brainstorming session, but the rest of the time, do what you're told, right? Follow the rules. And I think we have to embrace this idea of a creative culture or a creativity infused culture because that's part of that foundational element that allows for the agility that we're talking about. And in fact, in this framework, we, we do look, because it's actually an assessment that comes out of it, um, we look at those specific elements of creativity to try to identify it. And Charlie, what's, what's the role of leadership uh, in build, fostering that sort of culture? I mean, right, if, uh, it, does this have to be a top-down thing? Can it be part top, part bottom up? Uh, you know, great question. Um, no easy answers. I think it has to be, uh, by its nature, it has to be both bottom up and top down. You, you, you know, I, if, I, if I was your boss, Bob, and I said, okay, Bob, you need to be more creative. It's like, what are you going to do with that, right? So I think the, the, it has to be a bottom up, and that is about giving your organization the tools and, and, you know, the resources to explore their own creativity, right? From a leadership standpoint, it's mostly about freedom. It's mostly about relaxing a little bit. Um, this idea of failing fast, um, you know, how do you allow people the, the um, opportunity to explore this and to experiment with it? Because creativity by its definition involves, you know, 1% success and 99% failure. And most organizations and their hierarchical models are not built for that, right? And, and you look at, not to keep going to it, but you look at this restaurant example, is that they had to be willing to sort of go down that road and, and roll the dice on that. 
Now, what's interesting, and I, I don't know these people personally, so I'd, I'd love to, I need to dig into their story a little bit more. But if you look at, at either agile development methodologies or you think of like DevOps, these are all based on the same idea, right? In, incremental improvements and rapid iteration. And so when we talk about creativity, it's not like this, you're throwing it all out and it's just like whatever, hippie culture. It's about having a controlled fashion so that we can embrace creativity, but put enough things around it so that we don't go and waste a bunch of money or have these massive flame out failures. And there's a bunch of other pieces to it, but I think that it, they all go hand in hand because I cannot create this type of organizational agility if I have a workforce that is petrified to take a risk or to have any kind of a failure. So they have to go hand in hand. And I think one of the reasons why uh, people in organizations sometimes have that paralysis that you just described is they don't understand you know, two rings out from their little world in the company. The company is, builds the silos, reinforces the silos, the cultures perpetuate that, strengthen them, thicken them, and so on. And then, you know, sometimes management is surprised. Well, why didn't you just do this? Like, uh, uh, you know, we, we didn't know. And uh, Charlie, in some ways, you know, I think where a lot of companies are going to have to maybe start, and there will be certain other companies that will have to come back in and reinforce it, something that they're perhaps already doing quite well is what business are you in today right and a restaurant could have said we're in the you know bringing people in it's fancy tables fancy food delight to me uh, okay that's fine up until you can't do that anymore so there there i think will be a reordering of the fundamental sense of not just you know a fancy mission statement but what are we all about here and i hope i think that one of the things that's going to happen here is more of a focused and widespread um, emphasis on what is the customer, what do they care about in from us, right? Is it the product? Is it the service? Is it the experience? Is it dependent, you know, on and on down the line? I, the right sort of companies will have the culture to get that. And I think as you're saying here, if you don't have that mindset, if you don't have that willingness to deal with that, the, the uncertainty will crush them. Uh, and I, I wonder if that resonates with what you've been thinking. Yeah, no, no question about it. Uh, I think, and, and the experience that you're talking about has been one of the ones that left me slightly scratching my head, especially at the beginning of this. Um, in fact, I also wrote an article about, you know, does the customer experience even matter in the midst of this crisis or something, the title, something like that. And I was exploring this exact concept, right? Because, I, you know, again, when the first, when this first started hitting, it was, we were ordering, I mean, we live in a relatively small apartment here in New York City. And so we don't have a big giant freezer. And suddenly it's like, we're getting nervous about it. So I literally ordered a freezer and it was this crazy bad experience trying to get a freezer ordered. And, and I remember at the time, like being frustrated and upset, but it was sort of like in panic mode. It's like, well, I don't even care about any of this. You know, I don't care if these. And I realized that, you know, for the first couple of weeks, that was probably true. I think today, right now, the decisions that organizations are making about how the experience you're creating, not only for their customers, for their employees as well, and this is the whole work from home piece of it, I think are going to set the stage for what happens. We're, we're all going to remember this. We're going to remember the organizations that not only stepped up and donated money, but the organizations that managed to keep a degree of humanity in their interactions with us. And those that said, you know, hey, guess what? tough. This is, this is a crazy crisis time and all the rules are out the door, right? I, I think that we're all going to remember this. And, and yes, we will all have grace, but I think the ability to maintain that is going to be absolutely critical. And, and people ask me how, and, and I, I tell them very simply, it's simply acknowledging our humanity across every, if, if you are confused at any step along the way here, if you simply remember the humanity of the situation, and this is a great moment to just, if you were ever questioning whether or not we're all in the same boat, well, you know it now, right? We're all in the same boat. And if you can infuse that into how you function, how you operate, it is this amazing thing that just breaks through all the corporate culture BS and all the inertia of, that's not my job. It, it, it just throws all that out the window. And so I think it's, um, I think it's a great opportunity. And I, I think we're gonna see a massive shakeout in the end um, of organizations that come out of this so much stronger and have grown so much and those that just crashed and burned because they couldn't respond. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, 
<clears throat> it's something um, nobody could foresee, nobody could expect, nobody came into, it. and it does come down to all those key points that you've been making, Charlie. And I, I want you to know, I uh, this morning I published a piece. I called it, I think, something like "Pandemic Snapshots," but it was five CEOs from the tech industry. Just interesting ways they handled. You know, Mark Benioff with Salesforce. He gets a call from the head of a UCSF Medical Center and says, "Hey, we're running short on PPE." Well, suddenly Mark Benioff and Salesforce go out and they source and procure and deliver 50 million pieces of PPE. Um, Arvind Krishna, the newly, you know, he became CEO of IBM on April 4th. 30 years of the company, he finally ascends. It's announced in late January, and he takes over in the middle of, you know, this, what has been in some ways a nightmare, but, uh, you know, the dignity and grace that he expresses throughout his day one letter to employees. Um, Satya Nadella, you know, arguably, uh, if not the most uh, influential tech company in the world, certainly one of maybe one of the most influential companies overall, he would have to be considered among the best CEOs in the world, maybe the best. His letter to his employees, an open letter to the world, he talked about, I have to find ways to share the office space in our home with my two teenage daughters. Uh, you know, he didn't say like, you poor schlubs who have to do it, I feel bad for it. I'm doing it. You know, I have to live through this. There was um, Jen Morgan, you know, took over as co-CEO at SAP late last year, you know, a couple months into the job, bam, this thing hits. And she's talking about a Qualtrics solution that was created to help uh, what's it called? Remote, <clears throat> remote work pulse. And it helps employees and employers be able to understand how you're feeling. What's going on? What do you need? What are you worried about? What are you missing? And not getting overly touchy feely about it. But in times like this, that helps, I think, establish that connection you talked about <clears throat> in the last one, which, you know, it's not quite as grandiose as some of these others, but there's Larry Ellison, right? The uh, legendary business leader, innovator, one of the wealthiest people in the world. He made his first YouTube video uh, within the last week. And it was to talk about, not Oracle, but he's talking about their customer, Zoom, and how Zoom has become this essential part of the global economy. So we are seeing from the top down some remarkable expressions of uh, capability, of commitment, of courage, I think of compassion, and uh, I, I just, yes, there have been some big mistakes companies here and there have made, but there are also wonderful examples of true leadership like this that I think are going to inspire people, give you an example of, you know, don't be so worried about the boundaries. Don't be so worried about what we've all done in the past. And here are some pointers maybe for if this is what, you know, these CEOs are going to be doing, what could I be doing differently? What should my team do differently? So sorry yeah, no, for the long absolutely. spiel, but you, your, your thoughts today have really, uh, you know, triggered some of those ideas in my head. Yeah, no, I, I think I think you're dead on. I think that that it is it is um, as someone who's worked from home for the last 20 years, it it's it's been like a burden, kind of to your point of uh, that you're talking about of of always making sure that you know there was no over noise because it was like this big thing. And now suddenly with it, everybody, it's like ah, so there's dogs barking, kids crying. It's like this is our life, and and it, and I love it because it is sort of finally brought this to the fore that, you know, why do we try to pretend that we're not humans, that we don't have a life, that we don't have kids and spouses and pets, you know, just because we have a job to do? Are they, are they really at counterpoints? And I think, again, I think, I think I, there's going to be this moment of reckoning in the next, whatever it is, few months, as the world starts to go back to some semblance of normal and people show back up at the office. And there's going to be some organizations going back all the way back to the beginning of readiness and resiliency. There's going to be some organizations that think, okay, that was nice, checkbox, and now we're let's all go back to the way it was. And I think they're going to be in for a very rude awakening because this is going to be a cultural reset in almost every organization that has gone through this. And, and there's going to be others that are taking advantage of this opportunity, especially over the next few months after this initial shock is sort of waning and we now are setting into this at least temporary new normal that, that has started experimenting with new ways of working, of self-management models, of all of those things, and to your point of, of their leadership being willing to be human, right? One of the things I recommended in one of my articles was like, get your leadership team to go do a lip sync video like the celebrities are doing on Zoom where everyone has a thing and you're playing, right? Allow, just embrace this moment because when that starts happening, it's going to create this reset. And, and so I think we're gonna see this massive divide in a few months of those organizations that somehow forgot everything that we're all living through 
and try to put it all back. And they're going to, this genie is not going back in that bottle. And there's those that embrace it and are rewarded handsomely as we come out of this because of it. So I, you know, I, I, first of all, applaud you for knowing all those stories off the top of your head. <laughs> That's impressive. But um, you know, those are great stories and you're absolutely right. Those are the lessons, the, 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 the examples that we should all be following. Well, the last thing I want to ask you about here is, <clears throat> so, you know, you, you talked about that need for a, an acknowledgement of our humanity um, and the whole work from home revolution that I think is going to really accelerate that and, and signal the importance of it. So uh, a quick aside, uh, the, the one element of humanity that I hope uh, we can still ring out of this system is mouth breathers on, on Zoom calls or, you know, on conference calls. So that one, I, I'm not going to give up on that. But um, what's your sense? And I know this is really broad, but, you know, hit a couple parts of it, if you like. Um, there's a lot of people in a lot of companies and a lot of industries who are going to say at some point, I am more productive working from home than I was going to the office. I also feel better about myself because I don't have to spend 30, 40, 60, 90 minutes a day getting back or forth from work. I'm able to balance this work-life mix even better than I was before. I'm going to insist on, I'm going to work from home now. Is this going to be 10%, 20, 50? What do you think? Uh, as far as percentage, that's a really good question and I'm not sure I have a good answer. I think I, I agree with you. I think it's going to increase. I think there, there has always been a, a latent, uh, a, a high degree of latency in terms of people that wanted to do it and their organizations had policies or whatever that would stop them. And, and I think it's going to be harder for those organizations to keep fighting that off because again, we've proven it can work. Um, you know, so I, so I think, you know, what that percentage is, I don't know. Um, I, but I will say this, I think it's also going to be important to recognize that while there, I mean, like I said, I've worked from home for 20 years, you couldn't get me back into the office. It didn't, I don't care what you put on the table. Right. Um, and I agree with you. I personally, what I love about it is the ability to do, I don't even call it work-life balance. I call it work-life integration that, you know, I get these micro moments and it just, for me, it is immensely more productive, but I've also learned how to build the boundaries and all that. I, I can also guarantee there are a whole bunch of folks out there that are counting the days and minutes because they have to get back to the office, right? They have, they are having trouble finding that balance or creating that space and they miss that. I, I hired, um, this is 20 years ago, I hired this woman and I was, you know, pitching about the beauty of working from home and she couldn't do it. She needed an office. She needed the structure she needed. So I think we also have to have some, some grace here and recognizing that, that it's going to go, Every way, but but even even for those that do need to go back to an office and that is appealing to them and they like that, I still think the way they work, the way they interact, the way we collaborate, the asynchronicity of it, I think all of those lessons that we're learning here, those are going to be pervasive, and and that's going to be the stuff that it's going to be hardest for a lot of these large enterprises, in particular, to break free of, because um, because right now I think a lot of them are taking an attitude of well, it's like a temporary hold or a temporary exception. But, you know, come, come that day, all those policies go back and forth. And I think that's going to be the big, you know, red light there. But Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> Chad, has been a great discussion. Uh, love your points on a number of these different issues and resilience, readiness, and how those all come together. Do you have a final thought you want to leave everybody with? You know, my, my only final thought, if you're an enterprise leader, kind of trying to figure out where to go with all of this. The, the, here's the, the, the biggest mistake you could make would be to see this as temporary and to just sort of wait it out. I think we're, we're at this point now where, you know, my hope is that you see this as a massive opportunity and you want to use this time to experiment, to play with ideas, to allow your own humanity to flow through and, and just don't squander this. This is a, and we, I, well, I hope anyway, we're never going to go through this again. So take advantage of, you know, in, in the create, in all the negative aspects of this, find this opportunity there. There is the silver lining here if we choose to see it. Great, great advice, Charlie. Um, t please uh, share with everybody where they can find you more of your work. It, please. So visit me on my website. It's Charles Araujo, A-R-A-U-J-O.com. And the articles that I've been talking about are all part of what's called Your Digital Future Journal. And it's an email journal. And you can sign up for that at yourdigitalfuture.net. So appreciate it. 
Charlie, thanks. Uh, great stuff today. And for all of you folks, I just want to mention too, um, I, I, I second Charlie's notion to go and read about your digital future. Some great stuff going on there. This is Charlie's second appearance with us here on Cloud Wars Live as uh, Araho on transformation. And we look forward to seeing you next next month, Charlie, uh, when we'll, we'll check in and see how things are going and how the world looks then. Thanks, Bob. Thanks to all of you for being with us here. Thanks for coming back to Cloud Wars Live. Stay safe, stay healthy, stay generous. We'll see you next time.